Well, a couple of months ago, I went in for my annual physical exam. Uh, I try to do that every five years or so, uh, <laughs> give or take. Some of you know how that works. Um, before I even saw the doctor, the nurse comes in and uh, puts me on a scale and measures my weight, you know, that was okay. And then she takes my pulse and blood pressure. I'm always good at that, good and good. Then she took some blood to, t to t test my cholesterol. Uh, not so good. And then waited for the doctor to come in, and when he went through the whole routine, you know, he checked my eyes and ears, and then listened to my lungs, checked my pulse and all that, took, uh, check, check, listened to my lungs, and he always hears a little bit of wheezing, because I have this thing called adult onset asthma, and he reminded me to use my inhaler. Then he asked me some slightly personal questions about my diet and sleep and exercise habits, and he did a few un other unmentionable things. If you're over 50, you know what I mean. The annual exam every five years is important because it gives me a snapshot of my health. It can tell me if I have any developing issues. It can help the doctor prescribe a course of action. We all know how that works. In my case, he said uh, my cholesterol is a bit high, which it always is. I blame it on my mom, and he says I can, should cut back on the cheese and ice cream, which was very painful to hear. But what about a church? What is a healthy church? Can you measure that? Is there such a thing as a checkup for a church? I read some research recently that said that up to 70% of churches in America are in plateau or decline. 70%. One researcher guesses that about 4,000 churches in the U.S. close their doors every year. Now, reasons for all this are complicated and many, but how can we know if we are healthy? How can we know if we may need any spiritual prescriptions? Today we look at what I'm calling a snapshot of a healthy church. It's in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 to 47, as we continue our series called uh, Beginnings, Reaching the World. We're studying through the book of Acts this year, and we're in a, the, at, right at the end of Acts chapter 2. So let me read this to you. You can look in your Bible or look on the screens and follow along. Luke writes, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We're going to stop there, and I think the key word to the text, and many of you are familiar with this text, key word is devoted. They were devoted, as I look at these verses, to five things. So those of you who think I'm stuck on three points in a sermon, you can laugh, it's all right, I know I'm stuck on three points. I have five points tonight, so Jeff was very proud of me for breaking out of the box and going to five points. So five things the early church was devoted to, and this is the, 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 the test, this is the exam. For a church. First, they were devoted to truth. Devoted to truth. A number of years ago, I had a very good friend of mine uh, who was serving at a, as a youth pastor in Florida. He still is today. But this was right at the beginning of his career. Uh, he had been hired to build a ministry in a church uh, that would attract uh, junior and senior high school students. And it was a church that had never really had a successful, thriving student ministry before. And my friend was this uh, big... Uh, fun-loving, outgoing, creative guy, and he threw himself into this task with all sorts of energy and creativity. And within just a few months, he's filling this church uh, with teenagers, many of whom had never been to any church before, and they're just filling up the rooms of this church. Uh, and it meant that, um, the, that it was filled with lots of other things, too, because to, to do this ministry, he created environments where the kids would uh, have fun, which meant lots of music, loud music, Lots of noisy and often messy games uh, and lots and lots of food. And his philosophy was that if students were having fun and enjoying being at church, they would be much more open to hearing and responding to God's word. And he was right. But the church had never had quite had a youth pastor like my friend Joel before. And the music and messiness of a dynamic, growing, thriving ministry made some of the longtime members just a little bit nervous. Eventually, one of the elders of the church took my friend aside and encouraged him to tone down the music a bit to run a little more conventional style of ministry. And at one point he actually said this, quote, son, you won't find this in the Bible, but God says, okay, you won't find this in the Bible, but God says, and then he finished the sentence with something about loud music not being God's preferred style of music for youth ministry, especially not youth ministry in his church. 
Now, my friend is no longer in that particular role, but that story still, after 25 years, makes us both smile. We smile because it's both a humorous and slightly sad example of how we tend to prefer to create our own truth rather than seek God's truth. In Acts, we find that one of the signs of a healthy church is devotion to truth. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, the natural question to ask is, well, what was the apostles' teaching? We know that they didn't have the New Testament that we have. They were in the process of creating the New Testament. So what were they teaching? Well, if we go back to last weekend when Pastor Sterling taught on Acts chapter 2 and Peter's first sermon, we can assume that that was the content of the apostles' teaching. A mocking crowd accuses the apostles of being drunk at 9 in the morning on the day of Pentecost. Peter delivers what amounts to the first sermon in church history. He just preaches what he knows. He preached that what had just happened, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the violent wind, the tongues of fire, the speaking in many languages, was the fulfillment of what the prophets had written long before. He preached that Jesus was sent by God, crucified by sinful men, and raised from the dead as Lord and Christ. And finally, he preached that forgiveness from sin and the Holy Spirit are received in the name of Jesus Christ alone. Peter preached what we now know as the gospel. The good news that salvation is not found in religion, but through faith in the death, death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, just a couple of things about truth. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. To say one thing is true is to say another thing is not true. For example, 2 plus 2 cannot equal both 4 and 5 at the same time. We all get that. Second, truth makes us uncomfortable sometimes. Now, not all truth makes all of us uncomfortable, but perhaps some truth makes some uncomfortable. No one finds 2 plus 2 equals 4 to be threatening. Uh, I might find my cholesterol report to be slightly uncomfortable. But many, many people find the phrase, Jesus is Lord, to be downright offensive. Why? When it comes to mathematics, most of us agree on truth. When it comes to our health, we usually trust medical tests. Even if I don't like the cholesterol results, I tend to trust them as being true. I can't say, well, in my view, my cholesterol is here. I don't really care what the test says. I don't believe that is true. We don't do that. But when it comes to spiritual matters, many prefer to create our own spiritual truth. If Jesus is truly Lord, then we're all accountable to him, and, if, and there is no forgiveness or salvation without him. That makes us uncomfortable. Many would rather believe that salvation is based on good deeds and good intentions rather than the grace of the one who died in our place. The gospel can make people uncomfortable because it means we can't save ourselves. We can't be good enough to make ourselves acceptable to a holy God. And that makes us uncomfortable. We have to be dependent on another. and We don't like being dependent on anyone but ourselves. So if the gospel is true, we are accountable for our sins. We must surrender ourselves to the one who gave himself for us, and we don't like to do that either. We don't like to surrender to another. But, and here's the point, the gospel is either true for all or it's true for no one. The early church and every healthy church since then has been devoted to the truth of the gospel. They were devoted to the truth. Secondly, they were devoted to to each other. Devoted to each other. A few years ago, I read the story of a guy named Joe Ehrman, a former NFL football player uh, for the Baltimore Colts, who became a volunteer uh, football coach at a local high school. Do you have the image of Joe Ehrman up there? Do we have that? There you go. Uh, who then became a volunteer coach at a high school, and what made him unique was his coaching philosophy. After every practice and every game, he asked his, these high school boys, 16 to 18-year-old boys, two questions. He would gather the sweat and dirt-covered players and say, what's our job as coaches? And they would yell back at him to love us. And then he would say, what's your job as players? And the players would respond and say, to love each other. Parade Magazine once called Joe Ehrman the most important coach in America. Now, at first, it seems like some sort of weird oxymoron, coaching young men to play an aggressive and sometimes violent game by teaching them to love each other. It doesn't really make sense. But the more I thought about it as I read through that book, 
the more I kind of got it. It's one thing to block the guy in front of you because your coach told you to and he'll yell at you if you don't. That's motivating, but it's one thing. It's quite another thing to block that guy in front of you because you love the teammate standing next to you. It should not surprise us that Joe Ehrman was not only a very good football coach, but a committed follower of Christ as well. He knew that the greatest motivation in the world is not fear, but love. And he knew that love for one another is the foundation both of a good football team and of a church. Read again, how, or listen again, how Luke describes the early body of believers. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were devoted to each other. The word Luke uses here in Greek is koinonia. You may have heard of that word. It's an ancient Greek word that carries the meaning of communion, communion joint participation, the sharing of life. And the English word used most often to translate it is the word fellowship. Now, fellowship is a good word. It's a word we most often hear in or around church. But I fear its meaning tends to get watered down for us in our culture. We, we tend to think of potluck suppers and picnics when we think of fellowship. And that's not a bad thing. But it's not exactly the deep and powerful bond that Luke's talking about here. See, I think koinonia fellowship is what high school football players can experience after sharing a whole season of body-breaking practices, after sharing triumphant victories and crushing defeats, after shedding their blood, sweat, and tears together. Even though they're just kids playing a game, koinonia can happen there because they give real commitment. They feel real pain. They exult in real joys, and they do it all together. I have the opportunity often to walk down onto a high school football field right after a game. And you can feel and see what those boys experience. When you, get, you can also smell them when you get really close. But you can, after losses, you can see the tears just running down these high school boys' faces who wouldn't do that anywhere else in the world. But they do it there because they share that pain. And when they rejoice, you can sense their exultation. The men and women Luke's talking about here did more than worship together every Sunday morning. They shared life. They worshiped together, they prayed together, they ate together, they shared their homes and possessions with each other. One gets the sense that they needed each other for survival. Now, as I think about that, I'm not sure that we can recreate that same sense of intensity and devotion, almost desperation for koinonia today in our culture. Some of you know I spent the last five days, just got back last night from uh, six days in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Bruce, Dave Levan, and I were visiting a potential Serve the World partner in Dubai, of all places. We had the opportunity to meet some amazing people and to hear some almost uh, literally unbelievable stories. People for whom faith in Christ meant everything or caused them to risk everything, some of them risk even death at the hands of their own families. But you could feel in that atmosphere, you could sense it, this powerful koinonia that bonded them together. Now, we live in a different place, a different time, a different culture. The threats to our faith, the threats to our church, are not opposition and persecution, but rather comfort and relentless busyness. We have our own homes and our own stuff, and we live our own lives. And if we have time, we'll worship together for an hour on Sunday morning or Saturday night. And that's good, but it's not what Luke's talking about here. It's not koinonia. The truth is, we do still need each other. We just don't feel the same need to need each other. But in recent days, and many of you know this, we have seen and experienced koinonia right here in the Fox Valley. It's been an unprecedented time of loss for our church family. My 28 years here, a little over 28 years, we've never experienced the death of a staff member. And in the last 10 days, we experienced two. Just unprecedented. Kim McCart and then Pastor Rogers this week. We struggle to understand these things. We grieve together. We celebrate the hope we have in Christ, but we've experienced something else too, I think. And that is the joy of what Luke calls koinonia. Every time we gathered in hospital rooms, every time we gathered in the East Campus Sanctuary to pray as a staff family, I was reminded that we were blessed to be part of an Acts 
to experience. We're part of a church family of people who are devoted to one another. We don't see it all the time. But it's there. The koinonia of the, that the Holy Spirit forged 2,000 years ago is still possible today. Even for self-sufficient and hyper-busy people living in the suburbs of North America. And it's a blessing. And this is, by the way, what our C group ministry is all about. People gathering together at times when they haven't lost someone just to begin to share life together. If you're not a part of a C group we'd love to, or, you, or you'd like to check it out, check out uh, our, our adult ministries and get, become a part of a small group of people. May we be a people who do more than just worship together as almost strangers for an hour every weekend. May we also pray together and serve together and laugh together and cry together. May we be a people and a church devoted to the fellowship. Thirdly, Snapshot of a healthy church. They were devoted to generosity. Devoted to generosity. Now, as a pastor, I have an unusual privilege uh, to witness all kinds of small and large and secret acts of generosity all across the life of a church this large and this diverse. One such act took place maybe 20 years or so ago, maybe longer. It was very, very private. I can only share it now because so much time has passed and the people have uh, either passed away or moved away. I got a call one day at the office from a man who I knew and had been a part of the church for a long time, but had been somewhat withdrawn for a number of years. He'd gone through some poor personal decisions years previously, some poor financial decisions, and had in turn received forgiveness for those things but, um, and for a substantial amount of debt. Uh, but even though he was forgiven, he carried a sense of shame, and so he stayed in the shadows. It kept him from really participating in church life. That was the guy who called me. When he called, he just said, Please come to my office. I uh, have something to give you. So I drove to his office, sat down, and he said simply that he had been forgiven much and that God had recently blessed him with resources and that he believed the purpose of that blessing was to bless other people. And then he reached in his drawer and he handed me a, a, a fat envelope stuffed with cash, just stuffed full of cash. He didn't even say how much it was. It turned out to be around $2,000. He handed it to me and said, I just want you, I don't want anybody to know about this, but I want you to take this and through the church give it to people who just have needs, single moms and so forth, and I, but I don't want anybody to know where it came from. And so I promised him that that's what I would do and that's what I did. And, and we, he and I never talked about that gift again, and he died just a few years later. Luke tells us that one of the marks of the very first church was generosity. Listen and look as I read. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now, every time I read this text, I notice the connection between gladness and generosity. There seems to be a connection there. It seems that Luke has noticed that gladness and generosity tend to inhabit the same heart at the same time. I think he's telling, telling us that gladness tends to produce generosity and also that generosity tends to produce gladness. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Maybe think about it later this week. Do you know anyone personally, anyone in your life, do you know someone or have you ever known some, someone who was a truly glad person, joyful, who was at the same time stingy and selfish? I think you'll struggle to find a name that fits that category. Or on the other hand, uh, do you, have you ever known anybody who was truly generous with their time, with their wealth, with their possessions, who was also at the same time profoundly unhappy? That don't exist in the same heart. But gladness and generosity do coexist. They create each other. Generosity can be defined as freedom from a smallness of heart. And it's to be the defining characteristic, one of the defining characteristics of both us as individual believers and as the of the church as a whole because God in his very core nature is generous. Now, generosity comes in many forms. You know, it comes in the form of, of sharing wealth. It could be sharing time, giving service. And as a church family, we express our collective generosity through this initiative called Serve the World. This year we're going to give away Outside our walls, over $300,000 uh, to local and global ministry partners. That's what we were doing in Dubai. And we want to see that grow because we want to be a generous church. And I think there's also a connection between generosity 
and praising God. That's what Luke talks about. I think the early church was a generous church because it was a joyful church. And I think it was a joyful church because it was a worshiping church. So my prayer for myself and for our church family is that we would be remarkable in our generosity, remarkable in our gladness of heart, and remarkable in our praise because they're all interconnected. They were devoted to generosity. Fourthly, they were devoted to prayer and worship. They were devoted to prayer. Mentioned we were in Dubai for five or six days. The intent of that trip was to visit a potential serve the world partner in that region. Uh, along the way, we met, and I have to be real careful how I talk about this because it's dangerous for the people living in that area. But we met several what they call MBBs, Muslim background believers, or they call them cousins in that part of the world. Uh, and we heard some striking faith stories. I won't give them away. I'll be telling them in the months that, that, that lie ahead. But one particular man we met uh, uh, was an MBB, and part of his faith story, I'll just tell you a part of it, because I hope he'll come here someday and share it himself, was uh, when he was 15 years old, uh, he was disenchanted with his life, very close to deciding to take his own life, when uh, a relative sne secretly snuck him a Bible and asked him to read it. He hid it under his bed at home, knowing that his parents would be furious, uh, his mother caught him one day with the Bible in his hands. That very day, she held a knife to his neck. His own mother held a knife to his neck, simply because he was reading a Bible. And had he, and, and th these stories were repeated many, many times. This same guy, as we're uh, finishing up our trip, he said to me, knowing I'm the pastor of this church, he said, hey, Pastor Brian, I want you to tell me how I can pray for you and your church, he said. How can I pray for you and your church? He said, I'm a big believer in prayer. And there's reasons why he said that, having to do with his mom eventually becoming an evangelist. I'll tell that story later, too. He said, we have four secret churches in my home country, which was not Dubai. He called them underground churches because they can't come out because the people will kill them. He said, we have four secret underground churches. And he said, they are prayer machines. That's what he called them. They are prayer machines, and they will pray for your church. So I'm going to send him some prayer requests. And there will be people praying under threat of death for us. Think about that. These are people who've risked their lives to follow Jesus. These are people who gather in secret churches because their own families are quite willing to kill them to protect their honor. Yet yeah, these believers will pray for us. And they'll pray because they're devoted to and dependent on prayer. Luke tells us the first church was that way, devoted to prayer. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, I have to admit, and this is a funny thing for a pastor to say, but I don't really get how prayer works. I don't really understand how directing my thoughts and my words toward God can impact somebody else's life halfway around the world. I don't understand how that works. And yet... The Bible instructs me over and over again to pray for others, to intercede for them. So I do. And I do so in faith that just as I don't understand how my cell phone works, but I use it dozens of times every day, God simply has a spiritual technology that I don't yet understand. But I do know that prayer is powerful. I know that both praying for someone else and the experience of being prayed for are gifts from the very heart of God that leave both the prayer and the prayee blessed beyond description. Experienced that this past week. And I think the early followers of Jesus were devoted to prayer because they knew their little band of believers would not survive without God's help. I think they prayed for each other because sometimes it was all they could do for each other. I think prayer was as natural a part of their lives as eating, sleeping, and working. I don't think they had to be urged or reminded to pray. I think they couldn't help but pray. Again, we live in a different time in a different place. My guess is prayer is a little harder for you because it is for me. Is it something that you would say you're devoted to? Or is prayer hard for you to remember? Who do you pray for? Who do you know prays for you regularly? I think many of us struggle in our devotion to prayer, if we're honest. I think we often feel that the sheer velocity of our lives in this part of the world robs us of the, of the ability to focus and the space to focus on prayer. 
In the Islamic world, as many of you know, uh, a devout Muslim prays five times a day. They have something called the call to prayer. Five times a day, uh, the call to prayer is blared from loudspeakers from the minarets of the mosques all over the cities in the Arab world. One of the things, in fact, that confuses Muslims about Christians is they don't see us pray. They wonder why we don't pray if we're devoted to Jesus like we say we are. They're confused by that. Here's a simple idea. Let something in your everyday life be your call to prayer. Let your cell phone or your car, two of the things we use most often, be your own personal call to prayer. See your car as a sanctuary, albeit a mobile sanctuary. Use your cell phone as a prayer prompter. Decide who you'll pray for every time you get in your car. Make it a sanctuary of prayer. Decide who you'll pray for each time you pick up your cell phone to, to send or receive a text. It only takes a few seconds to pray. Let those people know what you're doing, that you're praying for them when you answer your phone. Let them know what you're doing in your car. You'll be surprised. Everyone you tell that to will be both grateful and blessed. Remember, you don't have to understand how the technology works to use it well. Luke continues by saying, and, we, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Awe came upon every soul. Awe is a sense of wonder, holy fear, and worship. And it's contingent, it's a direct result of being devoted to prayer. Lastly, fifth, this early church was devoted to reaching. They were devoted to reaching their world. A few weeks ago, uh, a friend of mine in this church uh, told a story about one of his adult children that uh, I thought was really, really cool, made me feel good. He said that his adult son, <coughs> excuse me, had recently invited a friend of his to come to church with him. But the friend had not been in church for a very, very long time, in part due to some negative experiences early in his life in church. The friend also had multiple tattoos and body piercings, and he feared people in church would judge him as they always had and would reject him as being unworthy to be in church. But here's what my friend's son said to his friend. He said, not my church, he said. Not my church. The people at my church are real, dude. They won't judge you or respect or reject you. They will welcome you. That made me feel good on so many levels. First, that's what I hope everyone feels when they walk into this church for the first time. Whichever campus or service they come to, accepted, loved, and cared for as they are, not judged. Second, that's what the gospel is all about. We don't have to clean ourselves up before God will love us. We don't. He, we don't have to clean ourselves up before he'll offer us forgiveness. He loves us as we are, takes us as we are. Then, after we receive his grace, he begins to shape us into what he wants us to be. And thirdly, that's what the very first church was like. Luke tells us the church was welcoming people into their number every day. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. Now to me, that's one of the most joy-filled and powerful sentences in the entire New Testament. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's break it down. Several things. First, notice that it's the Lord who does the adding. That tells us that it was Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that was drawing people to himself. Second, we see the young church was growing day by day. And that tells me that the growth wasn't happening because of some spectacular program they had launched or some sort of advertising campaign, although there's nothing wrong with those things, but rather because there was something dynamic and attractive about that community of people that other people just found irresistible. It was just happening organically. I think we see some clues in Luke's description of this group. Breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. People are attracted to joy. People are attracted to glad and generous hearts. People want to be part of something that's blessing others. So people came, attracted like, like moths to a flame. And finally, Luke says, people were being saved. They were being saved. That means people were hearing the gospel. Remember, they were devoted to truth. They were recognizing their sin, their inability to save themselves through religion, and they were receiving the forgiveness and promise of eternal life found in Christ. They were being saved. So, 
how do we keep from becoming one of those 70% of churches in plateau or decline? How do we keep from becoming just another sad statistic? Acts 2 gives us a kind of spiritual checkup, the key ingredients of a healthy, dynamic, and growing church. And here they are. Devotion to the truth of the gospel, devotion to the fellowship, devotion to prayer, extraordinary generosity and contagious joy. And finally, as all kinds of people are drawn to this community of truth and joy, being willing to welcome, accept, love, make room for every single person the Lord brings through the doors. That's the snapshot of a healthy church, and that's what God calls us to be. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord God, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for this, this window, this snapshot into our earliest brothers and sisters. Snapshot of a healthy church, devoted to truth, to the fellowship, to prayer, to generosity, to reaching. And by your spirit, may we, even here in suburban North America, increasingly learn to be that kind of church. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.